Good morning. Uh, welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Gary Bungie, and it's wonderful that we can be together this morning. I'd like to welcome those of you who are guests worshiping with us today, and we're really happy you can be with us, and I invite you to say hi in the comments so that we can greet you and welcome you. Um, today, our virtual greeter is Patrick Milligan, um, a new greeter. We're gradually getting some new folks, so it's wonderful to have you greeting today, Patrick. Thank you. As I share announcements this morning, I invite you to share any celebrations that you might have going on uh, right now in the comment section on Facebook, and I'll circle back um, to that in a minute. Just two uh, announcements this morning. As we gather for worship today, uh, we're beginning a four-week series on the letter to the Ephesians, which uh, I really like because if Ephesians is this incredibly rich uh, book of the Bible, and I find, uh, and I hope you'll find it as meaningful as I do. And then uh, the other announcement is that we have a, a guest at worship this morning uh, through the magic of video. Uh, this, that is Mary Campbell. Uh, Mary is the ELCA program director for Amparo, which is an acronym for Accompanying Migrant Minors with Protection, Advocacy, Representation, and Opportunities. And Amparo is the outreach of the month for July. And Mary is going to share more about Amparo, uh, what it is and how we might uh, become involved. So thank you, Mary, for being with us. I'm going to go back to Facebook and see if we have any celebrations. Um, Rachel is celebrating this year's bounty of local fruit, blueberries, strawberries, and cherries. Yes. Any other celebrations? Scroll up, make sure I'm not missing anything. I'm not seeing any other celebrations. So if you have some, um, you can. Oh, happy birthday to Luke Reese. Uh, congratulations. It's always exciting to be another year older. Um, with that, then, uh, we're going to listen to the organ prelude uh, from our organist, Julie Bagley. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. God of grace, we gather in your house full of regret and remorse for the things that have kept us from fulfilling your calling. We have failed to act and we have behaved in ways that disappoint, but we are your children and you have promised to forgive. We ask for your forgiveness and the desire to do your work in the world. God loves and forgives all of God's children. 
receive God's forgiveness, and move through the world unburdened by sin for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I invite you to join in singing the Kyrie. Let us pray. God, our loving Mother, you have nurtured us as your own and given us an inheritance of eternal life. Show us also how to honor and respect all that you have given us so that your legacy will continue for generations to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I said in the announcements, uh, today we begin a four-week series on the letter to the Ephesians. Over the years, Ephesians has become one of my favorite New Testament letters because it is so full of the grace of God and so rich in the language it uses to express God's grace. It's also so powerful when it talks about the results of God's grace and how God's grace calls us to respond. Ephesians can be divided into two different sections. Uh, the first section is chapters 1 through 3, which deals with God's grace and what God has done for us in Jesus. And then the second section being chapters 4 through 6, that has lots of imperatives and talks about our response to God's grace. We're going to spend uh, two Sundays on each uh, section. The beginning of Ephesians uh, states that it is written by the Apostle Paul. However, scholarship is really pretty much divided on whether it was written by Paul or not. Some scholars say that it was written by Paul. Other scholars say that it was probably written by a student or a disciple of Paul, 
because it was very common in those days for a student or disciple uh, of a famous teacher to write a letter in the name of the teacher. And the, the main reason is that any language, the language that is used in Ephesians and the words that are used in Ephesians are different from the authentic letters of Paul. I probably fall into the camp of those who think that it is not written by Paul. One more thing uh, before I read the reading this morning, and that is uh, kind of as I commented in the beginning during that last uh, gathering music, one way to think about this reading as this majestic hymn of praise taking us into the reality of God. Uh, it is poetry that is over the top, it's absolutely beautiful, and it paints this incredible picture of the abundant grace of God. So a reading from Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope in Christ, might live to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are parts of scripture that when I read them make me uncomfortable. There are other parts of scripture, when I read them, I just kind of scratch my head because I just don't get it. Then there are some parts that I read and I go, oh yeah, this again. And other parts of scripture that just kind of surprise me. And then there are other parts of scripture that I like to read over and over because they are wonderful. They give strength and courage and comfort and talk about God's love and grace and you never get enough of them. Well, this Ephesians reading is one of those kinds of passages. I mean, listen to some of the incredible phrases in that passage. Blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Chose us in Christ. That he lavished on us. Destined us for adoption as his children. Grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. Now, are there any words of scripture that better proclaim the incredible free love and grace of God? Or how God has lavished love and forgiveness on us? Tony Campolo, uh, the well-known Christian writer and speaker, tells a story of how at the end of a long trip and plane flight, he was waiting for his last plane and he was tired and he just wanted to relax and sleep on that last flight. 
And I had the privilege of hearing Tony share this story um, at a national youth gathering. Well, he was waiting uh, for the boarding to begin. And as he sat in the waiting area, he noticed this little girl who was all dressed up in this pretty pink dress with curly hair and lots of bows in her hair. And she was so excited that she could hardly contain herself. She was traveling with her mother and she kept running around that boarding area uh, saying, I'm gonna see daddy, I'm gonna see daddy. And Tony could hardly wait to get on the plane and get away from her noise. But as he boarded the plane and took a seat, he realized that he was sitting right across the aisle from, I'm gonna see daddy. Well, it was a short flight, uh, so there was no meal that was served. It was just drinks and peanuts, but for the children, they had cookies. And this overly excited, overly active little girl scarfed down Coke and cookies like he had never seen before, cookie after cookie after cookie and lots of Coke, and then the plane hit turbulence. Now, you know what happens when Coke and cookies meet turbulence? Well, she started vomiting time after time after time after time. And this amazing little girl had this incredible recovery time. She would throw up and she would instantly, I'm going to see daddy, I'm going to see daddy. And the stench of half digested Coke and cookies filled the whole plane. She had vomit all over her dress. She was a mess and she smelled worse. And Tony couldn't wait to get away from what he, the little girl he called little vomit face. And still, she kept going on and on with, I'm going to see daddy, I'm going to see daddy. Well, when the plane landed, Tony rushed out of the plane ahead of the little girl. And as he got into the terminal, he noticed this man standing there all by himself in plaid pants and in a plaid flannel shirt. And he instantly knew who he was. So he dropped back to watch. And his little vomit face walked up the jetway. She saw her daddy and she started running. And her daddy knelt down, spread out his arms and swooped up his little girl, vomit and all, and hugged her and kissed her. What a wonderful picture of God standing and waiting for us, swooping us up, vomit and all. What a wonderful picture of God taking us and plunging us into the waters of baptism to cleanse us and to wash away the vomit and stench, claiming each one of us vomit and all. As we're plunged into the waters of baptism, we're claimed as God's own child and adopted as God's children. We're forgiven, we're loved, we're cleansed. And all of God's blessings that Ephesians mentioned are lavished on us. In baptism, we receive all of God's incredible grace. So often, people tend to imagine God as angry and ready to punish. Or a God who puts all kinds of demands on us and tests us and is watching over our shoulder like a police officer ready to spoil our fun and catch us and condemn us. But you don't get that here in Ephesians. Because here in Ephesians, the writer paints this incredible picture of God's love and grace and forgiveness toward us in Jesus. This is a God who is lavish in love. A God who goes to great lengths in Jesus to love us. A God who swoops us up, vomit and all. But this isn't just about me and each of us personally. It's much, much bigger than that. Because right smack dab in the middle of today's reading, you have this wonderful passage that says, with all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. 
Now, how incredible is that? That God in Christ is going to gather up all things. It's not enough that God claims us. It's not enough that God lavishes God's grace on us in Jesus. It's not enough that God swoops us up, vomit and all, because the mystery of God's will and God's plan for the fullness of time is to gather all things in God. It is this marvelous vision of all earth, of all creation, of all people being restored and made whole in the fullness of time. And God doesn't leave anyone or anything out. It is all things. So many times in the course of this past year with the pandemic and all the political turmoil and racial strife, I've kind of felt overwhelmed and discouraged and almost even hopeless about the state of our world and country. How will we ever bring an end to racism or hatred that's so prevalent in our country now? How will we resurrect a political system that is so broken and dysfunctional that it can hardly accomplish anything? How will we ever address the growing global issues that we face? A growing global climate crisis? A terrorist threat that's no better even after 20 years of U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. Uh, increasing cyber attacks from Russia that, are, that have caused dysfunction and disruption and chaos in our country. You know, at times it all seems hopeless. But they hear right in this beautiful opening passage from Ephesians, the writer tells us that it has been God's plan and the mystery of God's will since before the foundation of the world that when the time is right, God will gather all things together in God. And God has set that plan in motion in Jesus. The biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan calls this God's great cleanup of the world. In other words, we're not left to ourselves and to our own devices. In the fullness of time, God in Jesus will make everything new, will clean up the mess of the world, right the injustices, and gather all things together in him. Over the next three Sundays, as we dig deeper into Ephesians, We'll continue to hear more of what God's done in Jesus and what it means for us in the world and what we're called to do in response. But until then, the only thing that we can do in response to God's grace is sing and praise and revel in the lavish, extravagant, amazing grace of God in Jesus. Grace that includes you and me and the whole world. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Amen. See you.
join together in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, eternal almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of all, the only begotten one, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, lived and loved among us, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, who descended into hell and on the third day rose from the dead. Jesus, our Savior, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the loving God, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to the offering this morning, uh, thank you once again for your generosity, and I continue to be amazed uh, by your generosity and by your faithful giving and support for our ministry. The ways that you can give are on the screen. Uh, let's pray together. You offer us so much, Lord. Because of you, we have inherited the world. We humbly offer back to you a portion of the inheritance you have gifted to us so that it may blossom into blessings for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said in the announcements, uh, the outreach of the month for July is Amparo, which is the ELCA's Ministry of Protecting Migrant Children. And this morning, we are privileged to have with us Mary Campbell, who is the ELCA Program Director for Amparo. And I want to share a short video that Mary recorded especially for us. Good morning, University Lutheran in East Lansing, Michigan. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you this morning by video. My name is Mary Campbell, and I am the Program Director of Amparo, which is the ELCA strategy to accompany migrant minors with protection, advocacy, representation, and opportunities. This holistic whole church response has, is now five years old and has been able to accompany migrants wherever they might be found in the journey, whether in countries of origin, transit, destination, such as the United States, but other parts of the Americas, as well as, the, as when they may be returned to countries of origin, particularly in Central America. Our international work has been extremely significant in being able to help people who have been deported from the United States and Mexico to make new lives afterwards in their country of origin. That means finding a safe place to live, 
being able to make ends meet either by getting a job or a micro enterprise, as well as psychosocial trauma counseling, because many have experienced such trauma before they left that forced them to leave, but they've certainly experienced trauma in the migrant journey, as well as in the, in the immigration system that they have had to pass through either in Mexico or the United States. We have been able to see a 95% success rate in some cases, where 95%, 88 to 95% of migrants who have been deported from the United States and Mexico have decided that they do not want to make the migrant journey again because they have been able to make new lives and safe lives. In the United States, we have a network of 200 welcoming and sanctuary congregations who are accompanying migrants in their own communities. What this has meant is that our congregations have been able to help people spiritually by accompanying them spiritually, physically by walking with them as they make their transition to life in the United States. They pray for justice and they work for justice through advocacy. Our, our ELCA Advocacy Office has a Migration Policy Director, Giovanna Oaxaca, and in this very important moment, there are so many opportunities for us to make the needed changes to our immigration system so that people actually can receive justice and so that their claims can be adjudicated in a fair and equitable manner. So we would ask you to join us as a welcoming congregation by making those commitments to spiritually, physically, and physically welcome migrants into your community, as well as by accompanying us through prayer and through advocacy. At this moment in time, we are seeing the end of the migrant protection protocols, which means the many people that were stuck in Mexico for the last two years awaiting the adjudication of their cases are finally able to enter the United States, be with their relatives and family members here in the United States, and go through their process here in a much safer environment. We are seeing the end, hopefully, of Title 42 very soon. Right now, unaccompanied children are entering the United States as well as some family members, but we are hopeful that by the end of the summer, there will be a process for those people who are coming to our border to be able to safely enter the United States and make their claims for asylum um, as, as they are able to do so in a, in a safe environment as opposed to remaining in Mexico or being sent back to countries of origin. We invite you to join us in this work. Right now we have congregations all across the country who are accompanying, uh, congregationally sponsoring asylum seeking uh, persons and family members to make new lives in their communities. And as a welcoming congregation, you can also join us in this very important work. We would ask you to pray for justice at this moment in time there and advocate for justice. Thank you for your interest on, in Amparo and we're looking forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you, Mary, for your message and for being with us this morning. Um, I have been a pastor in the ELCA since the inception of the ELCA in the late 1980s, and I continue to be amazed at the breadth and scope of the ministry uh, of the ELCA, the ministry that we're all involved with um, through our offerings. Um, and also, I want to say that uh, we at, at University Lutheran uh, are involved with, um, this is not an officially Amparo ministry, but it is very parallel to it. Uh, we have a school um, in our uh, lower level that is uh, sponsored by Samaritas. Uh, and the, that school is for unaccompanied migrant children who are coming here to the U.S. to be uh, reunited with family members and they are with the with um, Samaritas in our school for varying lengths of time, maybe just a few days to a, a couple, three weeks, but to help them acclimate to life in the United States. So we are involved in this ministry through our offerings, through this outreach for the month, and through the school that we have. As we move into the prayers, uh, a reminder that our prayer uh, response this morning is, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. In you we have an inheritance, O Lord, a family, an identity, and a future. May the world know you through us, and may we live to praise your glory. Loving God. Hear our prayer. You promise to gather up all things to yourself, loving Creator, everything on earth and in heaven. 
Be with us in our striving to care for the world and all people with the kind of love that you've shown us. Loving God. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks for all families, especially for foster and adoptive parents and families who model themselves on your compassionate example. Bless their children as they come to know more fully the grace that chose them. Loving God. Hear our prayer. Bless our brothers and sisters in the very denominations. Guide our ULC family to faithfully spread your word for future generations. Be with pastors Haley Vay and Gary, presiding Bishop Eaton, Bishop Satterley, and Pastor Len Dahlgren at Edgewood Lutheran in Fruitport. Loving God. Hear our prayer. We are marked with the seal of your promised Holy Spirit, and we come to you with all our frailties and infirmities. Wrap all those who suffer in your healing embrace, including our families and friends and members, Kim Kravitz, Joseph Kravitz, Carl Bennett, Ed Van Oos, Michael Kruger, Bruce Rhino, Carrie Hope Coast, Susan Fisher, Marilyn Wagonack, Jesse Archer, Wei Dong, Bai Dao, Marion Stoll, Dara Hasi, and Connor Hagman. Loving God, Hear our prayer. Gather us together with all your saints in the fullness of time that we might share with them your promised redemption and perfect union with all of humanity. Loving God. Hear our prayer. At this time, I invite you to enter uh, any prayer requests that you have in the comments section on Facebook. We pray for the families in Florida who have lost loved ones in the condo collapse. Give them your gift, the gift of your strength and courage and healing. We pray for the two elementary aged Guatemalan refugees who received prayer quilts this past week. We pray that people will continue to receive the COVID vaccine for their own sake and for the sake of others. We pray for Becky Jensen uh, as she discerns her path of faith. We pray for the ministry of Amparo and for justice for all. We pray for Sherry's husband, Tom, who is still struggling uh, with pain. We pray for those who are traveling on vacation. We pray for our school at ULC that helps migrant children. We place, place these prayers into your hands, knowing that you accomplish all things according to your goodwill. Give us faith and make us trustworthy to carry out your good work on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace held by God's grace. Thanks be to God.